Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our comparative neuroanatomy lesson. Today, we're going to begin with a lecture of the brain, where we'll review some of the regions and their functions. Then, we'll go over some of the terminology that we typically use to map out the brain. And we'll take a look at the brains of animals from other species, like mice, rats, a bear, a dog, a sheep, and so on, and we'll see how they compare to the brain of a human. And finally, we'll go through a sheep brain dissection so we can all see firsthand what these structures look like. To lead us through today's program, we have Mr. Joe, a fourth year PhD candidate, and Mr. Michael, a third year PhD candidate here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. So at any point, if you have questions, feel free to write them in the comments section and we'll answer them right away. So without further ado, let's begin. Happy Brain Awareness Week, everybody, and welcome to Comparative Anatomy. Today, we're going to be talking about the brains of humans, rats, and many other species. But before we do that, let's get a little oriented to the brain. So the brain can be oriented into many different uh, areas. We can go from front to back or anterior to posterior. We can go from top to bottom, which is dorsal and ventral. And we can also go from rostral to caudal, which is from front this way to down the spinal cord that way, also front to back. So that is one way we can orient the brain. But what are some other components? We have the cerebrum, which is composed of the brain we think of, the brain up here. We have the brain stem, which goes down into our spinal cord. And we have the cerebellum, or little brain, which is right in the back of our brain here. The brain is also um, divided up into many lobes. We have the frontal lobe, which is in, towards the front of our head. We have the parietal lobe, which is towards the back of our head. We have the temporal lobe, which is along our temples. And we have the occipital lobe, which is right down here in the back also. The brain is also composed of things called gyri and sulci. You could think of these as peaks and valleys, kind of like in the Grand Canyon. On top of that, there's many different functional organizations of the brain that I cannot get into right now, but just know that they are all there. There are also other internal parts of the brain, including the thalamus and the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum allows for communication to go between the two hemispheres of our brain, and the thalamus allows for information to come from our body to reach uh, different parts of our brain. So what are the building blocks of the brain? Neurons. Neurons send signals from one location to another and allows the brain to make all these different types of signals. And across species, this is pretty much the same. From fish to birds to rodents to humans. We all, all of our brains are composed of neurons and it allows us to function. So without further ado, let's see some brains. So let's start with the smallest demonstration brain that we have. This is the, demo this is the mouse brain. Um, and you can see some pretty prominent features of it. It's super tiny compared to Denise's hand. Um, you can see the olfactory bulbs over here, all the way at the top. And so after the olfactory bulbs, you guys can see the two hemispheres uh, right behind it. And then even more posterior to that, you can see the cerebellum. Uh, which, again, sits right on top of that brainstem over there. Now, one thing that you can notice is that there's not many folds or hills and valleys. Um, and you'll see that as we move up the ladder of species, our folding patterns will get more complex. If we can uh, turn over the mouse brain, we can see some structures here at the base of the brain. Here, again, is the brainstem, um, the two hemispheres here, and you can very smallly or very... Maybe you can see that um, is the olfactory bulb that essentially gives us uh, a lot of the information and sends out information for us to have the sense of smell. And so for this mouse, um, you can see that they are located right here. And actually, mice have a much better sense of smell than humans. This is because they're nocturnal and they're spending most of their time navigating at night, where the visual environment isn't that great. Sweet. Okay, so that's our mouse brain. Now let's take a look at our rat brain. 
So now we have the rat brain, and so you can see that it's noticeably larger than the mouse brain, but you can see that the structures for this brain is actually quite similar. Once again, here you have the huge olfactory bulbs, which uh, essentially give them their wonderful um, uh, senses of smell. And then here you have the hemisphere. Once again, hemispheres, once again, you don't see a very complex folding pattern for gyri and sulci or those hills and valleys, but you do see here a bigger cerebellum. Again, here the vermis here that connects the two hemispheres and the brainstem right below it. If we were to take this brain and flip it on the other side, we can again see the complex architecture here at the base uh, coming right through. Uh, again, here are the olfactory bulbs. We can even see the optic nerves here. And once again, here is the brainstem and midbrain region um, for the rat brain. And so that is a grand tour. So here we have the brain of a dog, man's best friend. Um, and so here you can immediately see um, a much higher folding uh, pattern. And so, you know, they say dogs are very intelligent and we can see why, right? And so we can see all these grooves, these hills and valleys that essentially show you uh, how much more complex the dog brain is compared to the rat brain. Um, but once again, we have um, some common features. So as you'll notice, uh, we don't have as much of a pronounced olfactory bulb here. And this is because although dogs do rely on their sense of smell and a little bit more so than humans, not as much as our mice and our rats. But if we look at the overall architecture of the rest of the brain, we can see that it's quite similar. Here again, you have the cerebellum or the mini brain here, um, posterior to the cortex, and we have the brainstem and spinal cord coming out right underneath it. Now, if we were to take this brain and turn it around, we can see again at the base of the brain, um, the complex architecture here. And here now we can see the olfactory bulbs here and here, the optic chiasm here, which provides um, a direction for the optic nerves to innervate the eyes. And here we have the pons and medulla, uh, which eventually go down into the spinal cord. So that is the dog brain. So this is the speckled bear brain. Um, one huge thing we can immediately start to see that a lot of the blood vessels are actually still here. Um, so here again, you can see a lot of the common structures from the bear brain, uh, but you can notice again, this complex folding pattern, uh, the hills and valleys again, to increase the surface area for this brain that's um, a bit larger than the dog brain. Um, but again, back here, you can see the cerebellum, again, uh, posterior to the cortex and the spinal cord just coming right out of the brainstem here. If we were to take this brain and turn it upside down, we can see huge olfactory bulbs here and underneath them you can find the olf olfactory nerves. Here again you can see the optic chiasm and here you can even have a glimpse of some of the cranial nerves right here. I don't want to mess with that too much but that's a, a, a nice example of how we have pairs of cranial nerves throughout the base of our uh, brain. Uh, here again is the midbrain region with the pons and the medulla eventually going out into the spinal cord. And that's the bear brain. Right. so next up we have the macaque brain and we often study this species because it's very close to humans so it can inform us uh, about some of the decisions and processes that are also present in the human brain and here again we can see those common themes with the two hemispheres we can see these huge little valleys and hills again forming the gyri and sulci for that complex uh, folding pattern um, all right, and so back here we have the occipital lobe and it's quite pronounced. And again, that lobe is involved in processing vision. And right underneath that, we can see the cerebellum here. Again, a very nice prominent vermis that connects the two cerebellar um, hemispheres together. And we have the brainstem 
um, coming out here, uh, which eventually forms the spinal cord. So if we turn it on its back again, we'll see those structures that we have seen with the other species. Here, once again, is your optic bulbs. Um, and here, again, is your optic chiasm, where your optic nerves will be, and a, another nice pair of cranial nerves, one here and one here. So right here, we have the temporal lobe. This would be right behind the macaque's ears. And this lobe is really important for, uh, first of all, for hearing and also for memory. All right, so here we have a human brain. As you can see, we have our sulci and gyri. Uh, we have our temporal lobe here involved in hearing, memory, and emotion. Our frontal lobe here which is involved in a lot of what we call our higher order cognitive functions like decision making, paying attention, future planning, uh, and so forth. Up here on the top of our brain, we have our parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is involved in something that we call somatosensation. So this is our sense of touch, pain, temperature. And finally, at the back of our brain, we have our occipital lobe which is involved in processing vision. Here at the bottom, we have our cerebellum, which we saw on several of the other species that we looked at today, and also our spinal cord uh, will be coming out right here. So now let's take a look inside the brain. And what do we have here, Michael? So we can immediately notice the band of neurons that form the corpus callosum here. And you know, this, this brain is quite old, so it's a little bit damaged, um, but also, you know, within or right on top of that, we can see the, um, the lateral ventricles um, and a lot of the internal organization or the subcortical structures uh, of the brain. So here we can see the thalamus and the hypothalamus, and we can see some of the other bands of uh, neurons that connect the two hemispheres together, like the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure. We can see the uh, very nice tree-like structure down here in the brain, in the cerebellum, excuse me. And um, anterior to that, we can see the brainstem structure here uh, is the pons, the medulla, uh, and eventually the medulla oblongata, which uh, forms the spinal cord um, towards the uh, spine. Um, and so this is essentially a, a very um, nice overview of the internal or subcortical structures of the brain. Um, which again is encapsulated by the cortex or the bark of um, our brain. And in the cortex, so we've been talking a lot about neurons. Neurons are our brain cells. There are actually about a hundred billion neurons packed into the cortex here. And they're constantly sending messages to each other, to our different lobes, and also to the rest of the body so that we can do things like move, think, talk, walk, and so on. Down here, we can even see uh, one of the olfactory bulbs here that will help us with our sense of smell. Um, we can try to find some other cranial nerves, like here we have a little bit of the optic nerve, uh, which eventually will form the optic chiasm. So one really cool thing about the visual system is that it actually crosses in the brain. So information from our right eye goes back to the right side of our brain, but it also crosses over and goes to the left side of our brain. Just like information from our left eye goes to our left and the right side of the brain. And the purpose for this system is that it helps us to ensure that both of our eyes can focus on an object in front of us and can estimate its depth. So if Michael wants to point to a region on the brain here, he needs to know how far to reach. And having that, what we call binocular vision, allows us to do that. So it's really important that we have our optic nerves crossing at the optic chiasm. And that uh, essentially sums up the human brain. All right, so now this gave us an idea of what some of the outer structures of the brain look like, but we want to dive in. So Michael's going to lead us through a sheep brain dissection so we can take a good look at some of those internal structures. Hi, everyone. I'm Mr. Michael, and today I'll be guiding you through the sheep brain dissection. Uh, so stay tuned and uh, let's get right to it.
So uh, like Mr. Joe said, I'm just gonna follow along and reorient you, reorient you towards the brain. Here we have the uh, frontal lobe or the foremost section of the brain. And this position is also called the anterior position. Now here we have the posterior position, also known as the caudal position. Um, and caudal actually comes from the Latin root for tail. So you can see that the spinal cord kind of looks like a tail here. So it's a really easy way to keep that in mind. Up to the roof of the brain, we have the dorsal surface. And on the bottom base here, we have the ventral surface of the brain. Now, on the dorsal surface, we have the parietal lobes that essentially sit right on top of the brain. And to the sides here, we have the temporal lobe, which again, as Mr. Joe pointed out, is towards the temple area. Now here in the back of the brain, and you have to uh, orient again because the sheep is on four legs and we are on two legs, but towards the back of the brain, we have the occipital lobe, that's not this. So here, this region of the brain is primarily responsible for uh, some of the visual aspects of our nervous system. And right here is the cerebellum, or um, which comes from the Latin phrase for uh, little brain. And so the cerebellum, again, is, you know, it kind of literally looks like a little brain that's attached to the overall cortex um, or cerebrum. And um, this part of the brain uh, is really important for motor aspects as well. And so generally when we think about planes of the brain, we have uh, three major planes. Um, if we were to make a cut this way, we would call that a coronal section. If we were to make a cut this way, we would call that a sagittal section. Um, and if we would take the brain and cut it this way, we would call that a horizontal section. And for this purpose, for the purposes of this video, we will be making a sagittal and a coronal section. Now, if we turn the brain upside down and look at the base of the brain, we can see a number of structures. Uh, we can first and foremost see the big optic nerves right here. And you can see that one of them has been cut off. Um, but here is an example of one of the nerves in your brain that is really important actually for uh, optic uh, function or um, functioning of your eyes. And here towards the brain stem, which is another structure in the brain that sits right below the cerebellum, we can see more nerves like this one that are coming off of the brain stem. And so there are cranial nerves that run along the base of the brain that are important for a lot of functions for facial features. Now, I think we're, we've covered almost all of it except for uh, essentially dividing the brain into its main region. So normally we would call the big portion of the brain as the cortex or cerebrum which is also known as, it's, it's the bark of the brain, uh, the cerebellum, like I mentioned before, as the mini brain, and the midbrain or, or brainstem, which is here on the underside. The brainstem can be divided into three regions, the medulla over here, which uh, eventually forms the medulla oblongata, um, the pons right here that sits right below the cerebellum, and finally the midbrain regions. And so one other prominent feature that you'll notice on this brain is that you can see all these black lining and which are the blood vessels of the brain, but you can see that there are these hills um, that are known as gyri and these valleys known as sulci. And so the function for these hills and valleys are to essentially make the folding pattern of the brain uh, a bit more complex. And I'll use this piece of paper uh, as an example. If we were to take a two-sided sheet, we can see that, okay, for the amount of information stored, this is quite a nice piece of paper. But if we were to start folding it and folding it and folding it, we could see that we can reduce the amount of area that really takes up in the physical space. And so we can fit a lot more information um, in this piece of paper. Um, and so that's essentially the idea of these sulci and gyri. Without further ado, let's go ahead and make our first cut. I'm gonna go clean down the mid-sagittal line and this, this fissure, as it's called, um, is known as the interhemispheric fissure because it connects the two hemispheres of the brain. And so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this. 
I'm also going to cut through a region of the cerebellum known as the vermis, which holds together the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. And so now we can see some prominent features, um, some prominent subcortical features um, that you can see also on the slide deck. So immediately we can notice this gap structure here, and we call that the, la the lateral ventricle. It is a space in the brain for the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. And so above the lateral ventricle, we can see the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is essentially a band of neurons that connects the two hemispheres together. And so you can see another, the same corpus callosum, essentially on the other side of the brain. And so this is really what connects the two brains, the two hemispheres together. Now you can also see the tree-like structures from the cerebellum or the mini brain. And so this is uh, quite identical to what we see here in the cortex, where essentially we can once again notice the hills and valleys coming in and folding into the brain, which really allows for a, a much a much higher surface area and storage of information. So we can also see uh, regions of the thalamus and the hypothalamus here on the midbrain. Um, and above here, you can see the pons and the medulla which forms the medulla oblongata towards the end. So the next thing that we will do is take off the cerebellum so we can more finely see what's underneath it. So I'm just going to make a fine cut here and carefully remove this structure here. So now you can see that the cerebellum very nicely sits on top of the pons. And here you can immediately see these connections here, which we call the peduncles, which are essentially bands of neurons that are uh, sending the information from the cerebellum down onto the brainstem. There are a similar set of peduncles that sends information from the cortex down into the brainstem. And this is through the thalamus. And so next we can go ahead and try to uh, tease apart the thalamus from the brain. So I'm going to make a, another cut here. And essentially peel off the thalamus or the subcortical structures. And so you can start to see that there's neurons that are essentially bands that are feeding into the thalamus. I'm going to take this region off. And so now you can see that these upper cortical areas are really projecting into the thalamus. And here, if you can see that, those fibers coming down into the midbrain um, and into the thalamus. And so ultimately, in this sheet model, these projections, which uh, convey information from the cortex, will go down into the midbrain, down the brainstem, and to the rest of the body. And so the one last section that we will make is a coronal section in our other hemisphere. To demonstrate that there are two types of matter that you can find in the brain. The first you can see is lighter shaded, and this is what we call white matter. And surrounding the white matter, you can see the gray matter. The gray matter is composed of the cell bodies, the building blocks of neurons, essentially, and the white matter are composed of the axons that are essentially projecting through down into the region where it's going towards. And so that's essentially 
the main types of matter that you can find in the brain. All right, well, there you have it. That is our tour through the sheep brain. Thank you so much for joining on the 2021 uh, Mount Sinai Annual Brain Fair. Um, and please make sure to check out our other web content. That's